Hi, thank you very much uh, to Glia for inviting me to give this presentation on Crabbe disease. I'll start by showing my disclosures. And continuing with the historical information about this disease, uh, the first time this was documented by, was by Dr. Nod Crabbe, a Danish neurologist who described the cases in 1916 of uh, two children that had a sclerosis of the brain and that progressed extremely fast into neurodegeneration and died shortly after. The next significant uh, documentation of the disease was in 1974 when Collier and Greenfield described the globoid cells that were seen in macrophages that showed uh, multinucleated cells clustering around blood vessels and the storage in these cells. This is what gave them the name of globoid cell leukodystrophy. Then a lot of time passed until 1970 when Dr. Suzuki identified the genetic deficiency of the enzyme galactosyl ceramidase that we abbreviate as GALC. And this was identified as the cause of the human and can canine globoid cell leukodystrophy. Uh, the Suzuki's also described the psychosine uh, theory uh, that I will talk a little bit later about. But psychosine being the substrate that accumulates um, and that causes the toxicity to both oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. The cloning and expression of the cDNA encoding human galactoserebrosidase um, was described by Chen et al, Sakai, and also Wenger uh, at around uh, the time of 1993 to 1994. And this was again a, a huge advance in understanding the disease. Most of these patients until then were being just diagnosed based on low enzyme levels in the blood. So, we now know that Crabbe disease is uh, caused by a homozygous or compound heterozygous mutation in galactosyl ceramidase or GALC. Uh, and in the mutation is in chromosome 14Q31. To date, there are more than 200 mutations reported. The 30 kilobase deletion continues to be a common uh, mutation in the infantile form with 35 to 45% of the pathogenic variants um, are found via targeted analysis of the 30 kilobase deletion. Again, this disease causes demyelination and dysmyelination of both the brain and the peripheral nerve uh, system and can present with onset as an infantile, late infantile, juvenile, and adult form. The incidence used to be reported as being one in 100,000. However, there are documentations in the literature of much more um, rare incidents of like one in 250 and 50,000. But there have recently been other uh, publications showing even a more frequent presentation uh, based in epidemiologic studies. So what happens uh, metabolically and how is this uh, psychosine increase uh, that is so toxic to the cells happen? So galactosyl ceramide is one of the major glycosphingolipids of myelin. It is synthesized by galactosylation of ceramide by the action of UDP galactose ceramide galactosyl transferase, CGT. Galactosyl ceramide is degraded to ceramide by the galactosylation by both GM1B galactosidase and galactosyl ceramide B um, galactose, uh, which is, would be the GALC. Cycosine is synthesized by galactosylation of sphingosine, which is generated uh, from the acylation of ceramide by ceramidase. Interestingly, cycosine may also be synthesized from galactosyl ceramide by the action of N deacylase. Cycosine is neurotoxic um, and presents at extremely low levels in cells and tissues under normal conditions. However, when there is GALC deficiency, 
Cytosine can accumulate to really high levels in tissues, especially in the brain. And unlike all, most other lysosomal diseases, um, the primary substrate of GALC, which is galactosylceramide, is not found at such high levels in Krabbe disease tissues due to an alternative hydrolysis uh, pathway by GM1 gangliosite beta galactosidase, as uh, shown on the left side. And so if you think in uh, not as much in the biochemistry part, but more the pathogenic cascade, you have the mutations, then you have galactosylceramidase deficiency or GALC deficiency, the impaired degradation um, causes then increases in cycosine. Uh, the galactosylceramide doesn't increase as much because of this alternative pathway that I just described but cycosine would increase and it would then cause damage to the oligodendrocytes. Um, and then this will cause degradation of myelin, apoptosis, demyelination will cause inflammation that then would activate cytokine release with microglial activation. And, uh, in, and this can cause uh, further cytokine release with astrocytosis. And in dogs, you can see axonal spheroids. You don't see that in humans. So what are the signs and symptoms of Krabbe? So it depends when you develop the, the onset. So the most frequent 85% of the cases are the infantile Krabbe disease that presents with symptoms within the first year of life and in more than 50% of patients results in death by two years of age. So you will see initial feeding difficulties and reflux that usually are not uh, picked up neither by pediatrician or parents because these are often seen in normal children. Um, then they develop spasticity in the lower extremities, which is mild and again may, may not be uh, noticed, especially by, by parents that are, have their child for the first time. The babies then shortly after become extremely irritable and they cry day and night. Um, in some of these cases, you can observe spontaneous third ventriculostomy at around the time of irritability. And this was recently published in 2019 by our group, uh, which could be one of the causes of this severe irritability that patients experience that suddenly goes away. Um, the treatments after symptoms have been mostly unsuccessful. However, the current standard of care for the infantile Krebe presentation, if you can diagnose them before symptoms, is umbilical cord blood transplantation. And the reason why cord blood is being used is because it's very rapidly accessible. And this disease progresses extremely fast, as you would see. So having a source uh, of bone marrow, in, in this case, it would be umbilical cord, um, providing the, the stem cells that come from the bone marrow can improve the outcomes of the presymptomatic and minimally symptomatic patients. Even after transplant, you can develop some progressive motor disease or progressive peripheral nerve disease. This is an example of the spontaneous third ventriculostomy coming from the paper um, that Dr. Sukoli uh, uh, published in Pediatric Neuroradiology in 2019, where you can see where the arrows is. This is spontaneous opening of the floor of the third ventricle due to increased uh, pressure, intracranial pressure. Um, in the late infantile form, uh, you will have most commonly involvement um, of the motor system, so but that starts after they start walking, um, and it's manifested by changes in gait. The first year, they usually have normal motor development. They may also present with uh, vision loss or slurred speech, hand tremors, some irritability, and if you do che check for cycosine, the levels are mostly elevated. And this is the form that we describe as 12 months to three years. In the juvenile and adult presentation, um, we have seen a lot of variability. And so there is very little information about both uh, the natural history um, for, for juvenile or adult. Um, 
and the initial manifestations have included behavioral difficulties followed by motor difficulties or loss of manual dexterity, burning paresthesia in extremities and weakness, or unilateral upper limb weakness and then lower limb hypoesthesia. Um, there, there is really a very poor correlation between the genotype and the phenotype. However, we know of certain um, mutations that would give you a, a later phenotype, even when you have a 30 kilobase deletion, as the ones that I describe here in, in the slide. Uh, they are combining, uh, com you know, you have a mild form combined with a more severe form and you still get a pretty much later phenotype. But besides these few um, mutations, there is really very uh, little we have to try to predict if a patient is going to have a juvenile or adult presentation. The cytosine concentrations may not be elevated and most of the time in those few cases that we have been able to um, test with cycosine, we don't see an elevation of, of it. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the hematopoietic stem cell transplant outcomes in infantile Rabe, and here we're going historically. So, so before infant, er, we, we had the infantile presentation divided into the early and late infantile, and the early was uh, described at zero to six months. Because these studies were done uh, a long time ago, this is how the patients are, are classified. More recently, after we did a natural history study, we have reclassified these to zero to 12 months. So just so that there is no confusion, this data that I'm presenting is the zero to six months. So back in 2005, I published the outcomes of a cohort of newborn babies that were identified uh, because they had a sibling that was affected. And um, what, uh, we showed that transplantation after symptoms, the, as, after you have any type of symptom, failed to alter the neurological course of the disease. And we compare ch children that were not treated to children that were treated symptomatically, and there was really no difference. However, those who were treated before symptoms because of a because of family history, then they, we, they it significantly improved their outcomes. If you don't treat them, patients die anywhere between one year and six years of age, with 50% um, of them dying by two years. Uh, some of the short-term outcomes um, that were published here um, address both the cognitive function that stayed normal and also the variable motor outcome. So what is umbilical cord blood transplantation? So the um umbilical cord blood provides a, a new hematopoietic system with white cells that carry the missing enzyme. This enzyme can be secreted and can be taken by deficient cells. And this is a mechanism that has been uh, demonstrated in pretty much uh, a lot of the lysosomal storage diseases, um, including uh, Crabbe. Uh, because cord blood is readily available um, with compatible units for about 95% of the population, uh, it's the preferred source for a disease that is progressive, uh, rapidly progressing. Uh, the outcomes have been excellent with about 95% survival for patients receiving the reduced toxicity chemotherapy that I'll talk about a little bit more. Now, this data that I'm showing you was what's data using what we call a full toxicity conditioning that is a little bit more aggressive. Um, in this paper, I showed um, the different areas of development. Cognition is the first one, then adaptive, receptive language, expressive language, gross motor, and fine motor skills. The gray shaded area is the variability in the normal population with the green kind of... Um, line at a 45 degree angle being the, the mean, median, sorry, the mean of the population and uh, the gray up above and below being two standard deviations and each patient is, is one color. So you can see that, that there is a huge um, difference between patients who were treated and then the ones that you see below in black kind of almost with no you know, the, the, the curve looks pretty flat. Those are patients who were treated after symptoms. 
Um, and here I'm comparing the chronologic age against the developmental age. So if you're, let's say, six months, you should be developing at around six months of age. Uh, so again, you can see that there is a huge difference between the ones who were treated symptomatically and the ones that don't. But the most striking difference is what you see in the gross motor skills, which is um, the figure E, that you can see an initial improvement and then this plateauing um, of gross motor function that we later uh, determined to be caused by a combination of um, spasticity, but mostly peripheral nerve disease. We went on to follow this population for many years um, and uh, in 2017 we, we published the long-term outcomes. So this is their long-term uh, outcomes. Now you see the same figures that I showed you before, but now we're looking up to 15 years of 16 years of age. You can see cognition continues to stay uh, kind of hovering around normal, but in the lower part um, of normal with one below normal. And then the gross motor, you can see plateauing, even in that case, that was the most normal, which is a patient that is now turning, actually just turned 18, and uh, can still walk and run and do all the activities of daily living. And that's our best case, but the other ones you can see are hovering at around six months to one year of age. So some of them walking independently, others with assisted devices and others in wheelchair. So the question was, what is causing this uh, difference? And why are we seeing such a variability in, in the motor outcomes? So we went back to look at the brain and uh, back in uh, 2015, we published in NeuroImage, um, the analysis of diffusion tensor imaging of newborns uh, in which we had about 400 controls and compared them to newborns with Crabbe and what you see in here is a standardized fractional anisotropy value. So zero, you, you can see the line is at zero and um, you can see those blue dots are all normal children. We started imaging them even when they were premature all the way up to, to about 10 uh, weeks after birth. And then you can see the red dots, they are all newborns with Crabbe disease. So you can see that some of them are very, have very abnormal fractional anisotropy. And if we do tractography, that also looks pretty abnormal and up to six standard deviations below normal. And this is in the first week of life um, or right after birth, up to about five weeks of, of life. So we then realized that of Obviously, the degree of Im impairment, even if you have a, a good treatment, is going to vary. And so this was a very important study to help us understand what was going on. Anyway, because this was published in 2005 and it became very evident that you needed to treat these kids before symptoms, um, newborn screening started in 2006 in New York State. Currently, there are many other states that are um, screening, but this has been an approval that has been um, state by state because when it was submit submitted to the RASP in 2009, uh, it was not approved uh, to do screening nationally. So this is what had ha has happened since then. Uh, however, there is a, a great uh, advocacy to try to in include more and more states in newborn screening. And I think now we have tools that we didn't have at that time to be able to predict um, disease onset, which is the biggest uh, issue is, you know, how do you follow all these patients that you pick up through newborn screening if you don't know if you should urgently transplant them or not? Uh, you could wait maybe until until there is a better treatment. So because of this um, and, and the difficulty in trying to, to refer this to, to transplant centers quickly enough, um, this, this has been the main reason why newborn screening hasn't been passed at the national level. So the states below uh, in bold are the states that are doing newborn screening for Crabbe disease. Pennsylvania was just recently added. Um, <clears throat> patients who screen positive for Crabbe should be immediately referred and the workup completed at a transplant center because this is considered uh, urgent since the disease is uh, 
causing demyelination in the brain very rapidly at this age. Uh, there are different tiers to understand if a baby screens positive. Initially, the first tier is just measuring if the enzyme is below normal. Uh, then cytosine is tested, and if it's above normal, then the patient should be immediately referred, and the sequencing and mutations should be looked at uh, in parallel as the patient is already being evaluated for potential transplant. For those who are predicted to be a later onset, um, developmental testing and neurological exams should be done every three months during the first year, every four months during the second year, and every six months the third year, then once a year thereafter. And this is trying to follow um, the rapidly progressing uh, myelination of the brain in the first year that then slows down the second and even further the third year. Um, and patients who are uh, transplanted in the first year, you really need to get them when they are asymptomatic or very, very minimally symptomatic to have a, a good outcome. Otherwise, the outcomes would be no different than the natural history. Um, so when do we monitor with MRIs? Um, every four months the first year, every six months the second year, and then from the third year you can do it once a year. But then you should continue to monitor them with developmental testing, um, and if there are any type of concerns, either behavioral or uh, the way they are developing, then they should again be um, referred to a, to a center of, that has expertise in this disease and consider for, for a transplant. So any patient less than 12 months should be referred immediately for transplantation. Newborn screening became much easier after uh, we published in 2017 cytosine as a biomarker to detect infantile and late infantile grave patients. As you can see in these slides, cytosine levels are plotted against age in months. The gray area is the where a patient that is normal that doesn't have grave would um, would be plotted. And this is based on the screening of about 100,000 100, normal controls. This was work done by uh, Dr. Mike Gelb. And then uh, the ones that you see in red and blue are our own patients that came because of uh, onset of symptoms in which we measure cytosine longitudinally, but we also went back and obtained their newborn dry blood spots. And what you can see here is that both the late infantile onset and the early infantile onset are very elevated during the first two years of life. You can see that it increases initially and then it tends to go down as they lose more and more myelin. In yellow, you would see the uh, patients that were at high risk. Um, these were patients screened in New York that we were following. And in green, you see the carriers that look just like normal patients. Having cytosine really improved our ability to predict uh, which babies would have um, the infantile form and would need urgent treatment. And this was a really important step in facilitating newborn screening for Crave. So the other thing we've done is we did a prospectively designed study looking at how Crave disease evolves over the months and years when you have the infantile form. And these patients were all evaluated the same way using standardized tools and following the same protocols. We used mixed regression models that were fitted to test for group differences with the age equivalent scores as the dependent variable and group and age and group times age interaction as independent variables. Survival curves were estimated using the Kaplan-Meier method. These were the two publications, one in 2018 and one in 2019, by my students, um, Maria Beltran and Nicolas Basco. Uh, one of them looked at 88 children that were uh, diagnosed because the onset was less than six months, and the other one looked at uh, patients more than six months uh, and up to three years. And uh, you can see here there were almost 40 boys and 50 girls, and then 26 boys and 9 girls for the other study. Uh, we looked at um, how many were 
symptomatic at the time of diagnosis, the median age of diagnosis, and the median delay between symptom and onset at diagnosis that you can see here ranged in the younger ones for it was about six months while the later onset ones it was up to 16 months. Um, but diagnosing, diagnosing um, them was the delay was only three to five months. So so the age again, the age that was the median age of diagnosis was six months and 16 months in both groups respectively. Given the results of these studies, uh, what we found out is that patients who had the onset when they were less than 12 months really show not much different difference. And we decided that it, they shouldn't really be called early and late infantile, but just infantile. Um, so we reclassified based on this, uh, the infantile form as patients uh, that have disease when they are less than 12 months and then the late infantile when they were more than 12 months. In this um, study, we also realized that um, patients between 9 and 12 months have a very fast progressing group and a slower progressing group, and that we could actually differentiate these by a scoring system that is explained in the paper. Um, the, there was in these groups there is evidence of disease in both neuroradiologic and neurophysiological tests because before the patients become clinically symptomatic and that spasticity decreased and becomes more of a global hypotonia after 12 months and that's because of the involvement of the peripheral nerves they all experience staring episodes shallow breathing visual tracking difficulties eye flattering constipation orthopedic issues and dysautonomia. And you can see the two survival curves uh, looking slightly different with about 50% of the patients with the early onset dying at a, about two years of age while the more than six months, but again this is combined with up to three years, um, dying at somewhere at 50% at around six years of age. So the things that we have to take into account when we're Uh, what about um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant outcomes? So we just recently finished a review of the long-term survival of late infantile Grave patients after transplant. And these patients were all treated, except for very few, um, with a more uh, traditional uh, high-intensity protocols in terms of the chemotherapy. Here you can see in blue, the outcome of asymptomatic, so they are all surviving, while the outcome of symptomatic uh, patients is a slightly less, and then symptom uh, sorry symptomatic patients um, more than 12 months and less than 12 months, you see a, a big difference. So we just wanted to compare here the differences between those who are treated, so when they have what we call now the infantile form, in the first year of life versus the late infantile form. Uh, so there were 19 patients, 15 males, four females, five died. Uh, 17 patients received unrelated core blood transplantation and two received bone marrow transplantation. Five were asymptomatic and 14 symptomatic. Five uh, were treated with this reduced intensity conditioning uh, recently published in Blood Advances. Um, and that is a much safer, safer uh, chemotherapeutic regimen. Um, so 14, 14 patients are currently surviving with a median of about 13 years and a range of 4.7 to 23 years. This uh, work of this that I'm presenting here um, includes patients that were treated uh, before 2011 when I was still in North Carolina. Uh, those patients were uh, transplanted at Duke University, and then there's another cohort that is transplanted here in Pittsburgh since 2011. The neurologic outcomes after uh, unrelated core blood transplant, um, you can see here that, that they were 
the cohort of patients that were asymptomatic, a very large percentage, so 40% improved, 60% stabilized for the MRI. Uh, you can look at VEPs, AVRs, um, as well as nerve conduction studies, and then the percentage that worsened. So you can see that in the asymptomatic cohort, they did really well. In the symptomatic, to our surprise, um, some of these areas still improved or stabilized, I should say, uh, like the nerve conduction velocities. Um, and then VEPs, on the other hand, uh, you can see that a third improved, a third stabilized, and a third worsened. And the brain MRI uh, worsened in about 46% of the cases. When we put um, the, uh, the more of the behavioral and uh, motor outcomes, you can see in the cognitive area, the patients in blue followed longitudinally are all within the normal range, so they were asymptomatic. Uh, the ones in yellow, who are the symptomatic onset more than 12 months, again, kind of, they are below normal, but they are all gaining, gaining skills. While when you look at the symptomatic less than 12 months and the untreated, you don't see a, a big difference. And in the gross motor, it becomes even more um, obvious because you can see now the black and red are totally um, not really improving. Um, however, those who were asymptomatic, some are below normal, but the majority are still tracking in the normal range. And the symptomatic after 12 months have some function. If you see there, they approximate, some of them approximate the one year of age developmental age, which means that they are walking. So again, you can see not much of a difference between um, the patients who are less than 12 months in terms of outcomes. Um, however, big differences if they have a later onset uh, presentation. So the conclusion is both asymptomatic and symptomatic children who underwent transplant had a longer survival probability, although those with symptom onset below 12 months had a higher probability of death. All patients who underwent transplant with the reduced intensity conditioning survived and engrafted. Uh, symptomatic children who underwent transplant had normal to near normal development in all areas except gross motor where outcomes can be variable. However, all are able to walk. Uh, symptomatic transplanted children with symptoms onset more than 12 months had improvements in all areas of development compared to natural progression, though those with symptom onset less than 12 months have significant difficulties. Asymptomatic patients showed improvement in all neurologic outcomes, while most symptomatic patients stabilized in a neurologic outcome, in all neurologic outcomes, except for the visual evoked potentials were only a third stabilized. Um, we talk about the two di distinct trajectories um, in the onset between 6 to 12 months, which is really more 9 to 12 months. Um, there is a more severe phenotype that progresses very rapidly, and then there is the less severe in which you have delayed in developmental early mi milestones and they never walk, rapid loss of uh, head control, cooing and independent sitting. Uh, feeding difficulties, re reflux, failure to thrive, abnormal protective reflexes, clasp thumbs and hand fisting, axial hypotonia and asymmetric tonic reflexes are significantly more common in this group. Um, and again, between nine and 12 months, it, there's a little bit of heterogeneity um, with a group that is a little bit slower progressive. And then in the onset between 13 and 36 months, um, they tend to develop motor milestones within the normal age range, um, but then the onset starts when they start walking. Um, significant differences between groups in cognitive language and motor abilities are seen. So the reduced intensity conditioning, we call it the PIT protocol, uh, was recently published in Blood Advances. All patients have normal enzyme levels. Uh, it was well to tolerated with minimal organ toxicity, with an incidence of uh, graft versus host disease uh, 2 to 4, uh, only of 27%. No extensive chronic uh, GVHD in any patient with an overall survival of 95% a year post-transplant, and no end organ toxicity was observed. Uh, they also were discharged much earlier from home uh, without a central line. Here is the um, 
survival so looks very very good um, now I would like to go over um, just some interesting presentations that you always have to take into account uh, we recently published this in frontiers in neurology it's actually in press uh, you will see it any time out but this was a, a very interesting cohort of uh, five patients um, that were all of Asian, South Asian backgrounds and presented with, um, in a very, very different way, really with vision loss. Uh, they did not have any spasticity or ex axial hypotonia. They all reached developmental milestones within the normal time. They did not show any abnormalities in nerve conduction, APRs, VAPs, uh, ERGs. Um, and the only thing they had was this vision loss with some patients that had, when they had progressed a little bit more, um, we could see some uh, abnormalities in MRI, in the optic radiations, um, and some periventricular um, demyelination in the posterior area. Um, in this case that I'm presenting here, this patient uh, had two siblings that actually were picked up through newborn sp screening, but the first patient was not uh, born in the U.S. Um, parents were first cousins. During screening at school, sc vision screening, they noticed that he had a poor vision. He was prescribed um, glasses by a, the first ophthalmologist, then so two additional ophthalmologists. Prescriptions were changed. He, he didn't get better. Um, and the last ophthalmologist, uh, when he was six and a half years of age, noticed that he had nystagmus with abnormal head position in an oscillopsia. Um, these uh, ophthalmologists recommended an MRI, and that's where the demyelination was noted, and eventually the patient was, um, was diagnosed. So again, all the tests uh, that we typically do were normal. Um, one year after transplant, they continue to be normal. The MRI changes is stabilized. Uh, the VP um, showed some poor morphology um, with macular pathway dysfunction, and they degraded in each eye, indicating general postretinal dysfunction with no asymmetries in monoocular flash VP, suggestive of chiasmal dysfunction. Uh, in the laboratory findings, uh, you can see that uh, only one patient had a cycosine level, um, but you can see the ranges of uh, enzyme levels. And um, in the neuroradiologic and neurophysiologic testing, you can see how the NCDs were normal and uh, some of the changes in uh, MRI. The hearing and uh, vision, again, ABRs were normal. And this, uh, this cohort was uh, fortunately uh, diagnosed on time. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, what we've been doing in terms of gene therapy. So we have developed in collaboration with Dr. David Wenger and Alison uh, Bradbury uh, this um, combination therapy uh, that we started first in mice. And what we looked at was a, we looked at twitcher mice that naturally have a point mutation in the GALT gene leading to GALT deficiency. Uh, we had um, four cohorts, the patients who were not treated, the patients who were treated with just bone marrow transplant, the patients who were just treated with gene therapy in the dotted line, and then the patients in which we combined the two treatments, and you can see the very large synergistic effect. Um, and so that made us uh, decide to move into the dog model. Uh, and in this experiment, we traded uh, nine dogs, um, three with um, gene therapy, three with only transplant, and uh, another uh, dog with uh, uh, the, the rest of the dogs with the combination therapy. 
And what we found out was that when we use the high dose of gene therapy and combine it with the transplant, the dog lived two years. We had to sacrifice at two years, but it was completely normal, both neurologically and with the histopathologic examination. Um, and here you can see when in blue, you, you see the myelin um, with, of the normal patient. So the three slides above should look in the, at the brain, cerebellum and the peripheral nerves. Um, then the dog with the crabe, you can see the very little blue. And then the one with the gene therapy and transplant, you can see it looks uh, almost normal. So we concluded that this uh, combination therapy was a superior treatment in both animal models of crabe disease um, and uh, that it acts synergistic, synergistically and provide much better benefit than any of these treatments alone. So we propose this as maybe the key therapy to treat uh, uh, newborns affected by crabe disease. There are other therapies uh, that are in the preclinical or in the about to start clinical trials. And those are using AV9 intrathecally and intracisternally or intraventricularly and in, or intracerebrally. That there is also um, an effort to use lentiviral approach uh, with ex vivo transfection of the patient's own bone marrow. There are cellular therapies, uh, cytosine reducing approaches and antioxidant anti-inflammatory anti therapy. So in summary, um, there are different uh, presentation subtypes. Remember, er, infantile is now less than 12 months and late infantile 12 months to 3 years, juvenile and then adult after uh, 18 years. Uh, the inher inheritance is autosomal recessive. There are more than 200 mutations. 35 to 40% have the infantile 30 kilobase deletion, the most common one. The Y319C mutation is associated, associated mostly with vision loss. Um, the, the other associated laboratory findings are elevated cycosine, but only in the infantile form. Uh, the later onset forms, cycosine, cycosine is not predictive. Uh, key imaging features, um, the increased intensity signal in the internal capsule, the caudate, thalamus, enhance, enhancement of the optic nerves in the infantile form. And again, in this other form in Asian patients that only you will only see changes in the optic radiations and occipital findings. Treatments uh, currently are only transplantation, umbilical cord blood or bone marrow. Um, and gene therapy is about to, to come to clinical trials. Um, Porch Biologics is doing the combination IV, AV10 with a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Passes Bio has the AV9 intracisternally. These are the closer to patients right now. In terms of anticipatory guidance, uh, newborn screening is extremely important for optimal outcomes. And late, late onset patients that are more than 12 months benefit even after symptoms. And this is all I have, this is our group. Um, we have a neurologist, Dr. Rajan, Dr. Poise, a statistician. Dr. Wang is uh, one of our progr pro program leads um, for Crabe gene therapy. Madeleine Saxon and Christina are uh, nurse practitioners. Then we have physical therapists, Kelly and Shannon, Lynn and Allison are speech therapists. Diana is our genetic counselor. And then our postdocs, uh, Mabel Lopez, um, Keith Whirling, uh, and uh, so our, some of our coordinators, Melissa uh, Bree, and administrator Sarah. I would like to acknowledge um, the Dr. Paul Sabolc in the pediatric bone marrow transplant, our neuroradiologists, Dr. Zucoli and Penegrahi. Uh, and our collaborators, uh, Dr. Steiner, Dr. Wenger, Dr. Bradbury, Dr. Kel Borsini, uh, Dr. Kurtzbeck at Duke, um, as well as the foundations. Specifically, I would like to thank the Legacy of Angels Foundation for providing um, very, very uh, com uh, strong support to both our infrastructure and uh, the development of our combination therapy the Dana Foundation for our imaging uh, support, as well as the National Institute of Health for our neuroimaging um, uh, 
protocols that we have developed that are predictive also of disease progression. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, you can call, contact me um, at my email or phone number. Thanks again, Glia, for the invitation. Goodbye.